right, hello and welcome to another Expert Insight interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM, joining you as usual from actually pretty sunny San Diego, but I'm joined by Annie P. Ruggles, who is up in Chicago. It may be sunny there, I don't know, but it's certainly got, what, 12, 16, 20, 400 inches of snow? What is it? Somewhere approximately between 16 and 47,000, like you said. But yeah. if you're watching this on video, you will notice that I have this ghostly sheen because the sun has been entirely blocked out by snow. So I'm I'm especially iridescent today. Yeah, <laughs> I love it. And well, I've got my all year round tan. What can I say? <laughs> <laughs> which, which growing up and, you know, spending a lot of my life in Ireland uh, was not something I ever um, imagined I would have. I was uh, just as uh, I was probably more. I could probably stand beside you back in my Irish days and you wouldn't even see me. I was that pale. I don't tan well. So in Chicago, I'm kind of just working with what I've got. <laughs> because if I lived in anywhere remotely warm, I would be red all the time. Yeah, well, yeah. Well, I used to be like that, but you just damage your skin enough and it'll do it. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that wonderful yeah. advice on damaging my skin, John. Appreciate it. <laughs> All right. So, uh, Annie, you are the founder and dean of the Non-Sleazy Sales Academy, where you've guided hundreds of people towards making deeper connection, lasting impressions and friendlier, more lucrative transactions, which is uh, which is always a good thing and what we want. And what we're going to talk today about is the old chestnut and the everlasting chestnut of sales avoidance. And as we were saying just before we came on air, I do think that you know, the fact that a lot of people have had to go virtual now with their selling and yeah. maybe reorient the way they're selling or maybe move into adjacent markets or maybe pivot products is so much has gone on, obviously, over the last year or so because of the pandemic situation. Yeah, that has lightly uh, added a whole new level of stress to maybe some salespeople who are already kind of struggling with the notion of being salespeople in the first place. Um, and now this is this is uh, layered on top. So, um, Annie, when you work with people um, who they want to be salespeople, they want to be successful salespeople, but there are these things holding them back. How do you mm -hmm. start? How do you start to unpack that? The cornerstone is what is you and your opinion of what you're offering and what you're providing and what is sales baggage? OK, because mm -hmm. we've all been sold to horrifically before and if you're listening to a sales podcast you've probably been not only sold to in a way that really hurt you offended you abused you you've probably also been taught to sell in some ways that never felt right and maybe you tried them on maybe you had to Right? Like I work with a lot of people that are very luxurious, like me, who has complete control over what I'm selling, who has complete control over everything that I say. And I don't have to follow someone else's script, right? But right. but what I see like over and over and over in that sales avoidance space is that they're worried about parroting behaviors that do not connect with their ethics and morals. So the very first thing is you might need to fall back in love with whatever the heck it is you're selling so that you're selling from that gooey why place. Now, not all buyers love storytelling. Not all buyers really care about the why, but you may need to, to wrap your head around the fact that you're not jamming something down somebody's throat. You're providing something that people want and need. If you're still using words like sleazy, slimy, ooey gooey, nasty, I need to take a shower. I need to lay down and take a nap. I'm allergic to sales. That is sales mm. baggage. That is not really the art and practice of exchanging energy, which is money, for your labors of love. Yeah, and it's and it's fascinating. There's there's a couple of things there that I want to do uh, focus in on. The first one there is what you said about you're going back and falling in love again with what you're selling. I mean, I think that is it is so critical because, I mean, let's face it we can tell immediately when somebody doesn't love what they sell or they're maybe is ambivalent at, at, at best maybe they're ambivalent towards what they're selling mm -hmm. um we want and that's because when we engage with somebody let's face it i mean we want 
we want their product to be fantastic and we want them to think their product is fantastic and we want their enthusiasm to wash over us. Yes, absolutely. Because I think everyone, although I don't think this because I don't want there to be victims of this scenario, yeah. but I think the people that are the best salespeople that are able to do relationship-based selling and non-sleazy selling like what I teach and what I see all the time the people that are best at that naturally are the people that have had to sell things that they hate or sell for people that they don't trust themselves. Now, again, mm -hmm. I don't want people to have to be the victims of this, but if you know what it feels like to have to try to make excuses and arm twist and do all that nasty stuff if you leave that baggage in the past when you're selling something that you dearly love or dearly believe in whether you're an entrepreneur or in a corporate environment or in a brick and mortar or online for the very first time when you have that belief the rest of that junk can fall away so you can really just do your job which is shutting up and listening and seeing if you have the product and service that they need mm -hmm. and just just um again just honing in on that that point that you um that you just made about baggage because i think baggage is incredibly important and i'm not sure that people always recognize that they have it and i do think that's one of the most liberating things is when you do recognize that you have baggage and i always say nowadays is uh what baggage are you going to carry on and what baggage are you going to check right I, yes. would, I would i would recommend that you check most of your baggage and the only baggage you carry on is the is the positive supporting baggage yes and the rest of it light it on fire yeah, yeah. right <laughs> especially people that are coming from corporate environments and they're jumping into entrepreneurship or mm -hmm. people in nonprofits who are used to selling in a corporate environment, right? If you're used to selling something or having to sell something, whether it's a product, a service, or if you're a manager, if it's a policy, you know, if it's team lunch that you have to sell mm -hmm. everybody on, whatever that is, it's so important that you understand that having something passionate in you that you can sell to is an entirely different ball game than the ways that you have been taught to sell other people's stuff. Okay. Yeah. It's a different skill set, which is great for people who go, well, I don't have any natural skill in sales. Yeah, you do. If you are an introvert, you have a natural skill in sales. If you are an empath, you have natural skills in sales. If you're one of those people like me who could befriend a tree stump, you have natural <laughs> skills in sales. It's the baggage part that tells you that you're not instead what if your baggage could be liberating like your point take the baggage that's educational the best way to make baggage educational is to look at what caused the baggage like look at who hurt you and make an action item or rule or boundary within your own practices or your own business if you're self-employed make an action item to the contrary if you hate that someone voided a guarantee that you bought because of it, then make a policy, bring that into how you offer a guarantee, right? Yeah. If you hate the way that someone broke you down with a pain point on a sales call, then look specifically at how you broach the topic of pain on a sales call. That's the baggage we carry with us. Everything else is just you having to hustle to sell somebody else's junk. Yeah, and I love the way you put that is basically is using it, um, using it to your advantage, but really, uh, as you said, is using it as a learning, as a learning tool to improve and to be to get better. And instead of, and it's good to look and it's good sometimes to say, okay, yeah, that, that really threw me or, you know, I, I was totally knocked off my, 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 uh, my rhythm by that or whatever, I lost the sale because they introduced something and I didn't know how to deal with it. All these are great things that you can say, okay, mm -hmm. I can either sit there and be scared on every call that the same thing is going to happen, or I can preempt it. Yeah. And when you're still on the call, okay, you get knocked off your game. If you still have time left and you still have that person's attention, you can steer that puppy back in. 
right? Mm -hmm. You can you can corral that thing. And one of the ways is not rushing back into your spiel, not rushing back into tactics, right? Into unnecessary urgency or scarcity or the weird NLP seminar that you picked up once and mm -hmm. sort of understand. I love NLP, but I hear a lot of people <laughs> misuse it, right? But mm -hmm. don't do that. Hush, ask a question and listen and you'll turn the car around. You will bring the conversation back if you stop. If you try to jam the spiel in there when the car's already spinning, I've mixed like 87 metaphors at this point. I'm sorry that you all have a metaphor <laughs> whiplash. But if you try to, to add spiel back into this, it's gonna feel disjointed. They're gonna feel like you're not listening. It's gonna take an uncomfortable moment and ideally make it more uncomfortable. What if you can pause, ask a question, take a breath and listen to the answer, drop the spiel, drop the baggage, and then just answer the question. Yeah, yeah, because I mean, who hasn't, who, who doesn't react well when you, okay, so if they say something, you get knocked a bit off your game, and then you go, hmm, it's an interesting point you raise. Um, could you expand on that a little so I understand it better? Like now, immediately I have, I have validated you, yeah. I have compliment. I have complimented you, and I have put the onus back on you to really explain what you're talking about, and that gives me the opportunity to learn more and to mm -hmm. and to uh, gather myself. Absolutely, and that all goes. I mean, if you treat it that way, it's almost like how I am always yelling at people about objection handling, right? Because that point of confusion, that point of discomfort, you could see that as an objection. Right. Mm -hmm. Most yeah. of the time I teach objections as like opportunities to teach a little more. Right. But in these mm -hmm. particular instances, they're a point of confusion. And the objection is, I'm not sure I want to hire this person anymore. Mm -hmm. Right. So what if instead of arguing the objection, instead of calling yourself out, instead of doing all those things, what if instead of handling the objection that way, you leaned into it? And you said, you know, I have absolutely no idea how to answer that question. I wish I did. I don't. And here's why. My lane is over here. My area of genius is over here. You ask me a question that's just around the outside. So here's what I know and here's what I don't. Does that change if you think I'm the right fit for you? Because if so, I will gladly find you someone that knows a better answer to that. But over here from where I'm looking at, you just blew my mind a little. Thanks for that. Let me get back to you if you'd like an answer from me on that topic. But back to you, Bob, right? And that, mm -hmm. you're fine. Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, because you're basically being honest. Uh, I mean, I think uh, exactly what you were saying about earlier, the, sometimes the natural instinct is to go into just babbling, right? It's just to <laughs> fit the noise and just be like talking nonsensically around the whole thing and confusing yourself and just, you know, and the other person, you're just ensuring that they are now completely like switched off by the whole experience. So <sighs> it's that, but it takes that, isn't that the thing, Annie, though? It does take some level of confidence and self-awareness for you to be able to calm down and stay silent in those moments to go or to say okay you know can you explain a little more and just say oh, i'm not going to react i'm not going to react yep it's not about you mm -hmm. it's not about you even if you're a one-person business it's not about you if you're on the phone with somebody it's about them. So if your ego is creeping in, number one, great, congratulations, you're human. If you're a little embarrassed, great. It means that you care about what you're doing. If you're worried about manipulating this person, maybe selling them the wrong thing, great. It means you care about your buyer. If you don't know how to answer a question, great. That means you're listening. Okay, take all those things, focus on that. When you take your little breath, realize that you are actually trying to help someone get your bearings mm -hmm. and dive back in. Yeah, I think that's a great way of putting it there because what you've just done is reframed all of those things, right? Uh, from where you could possibly look on them as negative, but you've reframed them and actually said, no, this is good. This is all good. This is actually enriching the whole interaction. Yes, yes. The only people that have never felt sales avoidance or don't feel it to this day, and the only person that does not botch a sale every now and again 
is someone who is so unctuous and so slimy and so well rehearsed and so magnetic that they just do their spiel with their well-oiled machine and if that's their bag good for them you know who else has that same skill set con men I'm not saying the two groups are the same. I'm saying if you can't relate to that level of performance, that's okay. The rest of us down here are just trying to help people. But if we get in our own way by babbling, by shooting ourselves in the foot, by talking ourselves in circles, by answering questions we have no business asking, mm. or sorry, answering, by asking questions that are no no right person in their right mind would ask if you went into a coffee shop, then don't ask it. Yeah. Right? No, I, we I, have I, I, control. I, I... Yeah, and I love that. I love what you just said there about answering questions that we've no business answering, or just. And the other part is just being being honest about not knowing something, because I think what people sometimes misunderstand is that, yes, the other person may think, okay, you know, you're selling X product, therefore you should know everything about it, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. However. If you then if you then ask me a question about something and I say, well, that's interesting. I, you know, I don't actually know the answer to that. That's something I'll have to I'll have to look into. Um, that's more trust building than yes. it is if I if I give you some if I give you some obtuse answer. Get a Rolodex, old school. I'm not talking digital, y'all. Get mm -hmm. a old school crank the wheel Rolodex and put people that are adjacent to your lane in a freaking rolodex do this because it's like that tv show pawn stars where people bring in like weird mm -hmm. relics and they're like oh i don't have knowledge of a 1956 mickey mouse figurine but let me call in my 1950s disney expert have a 1950s Disney expert on standby. Have somebody who you can call in to answer the question well, whether or not they agree with you. Because sometimes if you're referring out to people that don't agree with you, they're like, oh, okay, wait, I see what Annie's doing. I get it. I see that. Here's another perspective, but go back to Annie. Be the person that knows the answer or be the person who knows the person who knows yeah. the answer in either way you'll look like the same level of expert yeah and it is actually one of the the secrets of one of the the secrets of of sales of adding extra value is that whole idea of being a broker and a broker yes. of capabilities and that is something that people often overlook um because yeah it's great if you if just like you said with the pawn stars um example there is yeah they don't they don't pretend to be experts on everything but but they have a great network of people who are and just for anyone who may be a millennial or or gen z or uh, you're watching this rolodex um you probably want to check your local <laughs> so check your museum go but go down to the museum oh. and you'll find it but yes and when you look it up online you will realize that once a, once upon a time we actually had to take someone's business card and actually put it into the little slot in the right alphabetical order um but hey I, I, I would hazard that we knew who was in our Rolodex a lot more than we know who's in our contact list now. Uh, let me take my own advice here. You threw me for a minute with that uh, age comment. <laughs> Am I really <laughs> that old that the babies don't know what a Rolodex is? So mm -hmm. by my own previous advice, mm -hmm. I will take a breath. I will remember that I am old to some people and young to others and that it's not about me. And then I will say, my, what a fascinating point you made, John, about the fact that the babies don't know what a Rolodex is. I'll have to consider that in future spiels. See, <laughs> I brought it right back in. Yeah, no, exactly, exactly. But you know what is funny though, is that, I mean, unfortunately they, they don't see a lot of this, but it's actually, as I was saying, the, the, the physical act of actually having to take a card and put it in a Rolodex and all of that oh. me meant, you know, but, it also meant that you learn, you you pay more attention to it because there's still there is some research has been done mm -hmm. even more even recently that if you physically write down a to do list, you are far more likely to actually complete the tasks on it than you are if you do a digital to do yeah. list. Absolutely, because you're involving another part of your brain. 
Yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, so, so let's talk a little bit about, obviously, a lot of people are selling virtually now, and probably mm -hmm. some of them for the first time, and it's been forced upon them. And it's, and maybe some of them are thinking, oh, I can't wait for this pandemic to be over when I can go back to the normal way I used to sell, even though perhaps the people in the leadership of their company are going, hang on a second, we're saving a bunch of money in here and the customers right. don't seem to care about whether we show up in front of them or on Zoom. Uh -huh. So how do you, what do you say to people who are maybe struggling with virtual selling, how to get over that? Your best sellers in terms of the lines that you say, the questions that you ask, those kinds of best sellers, your performance best sellers, Either they still work or they're like two inches away. So mm -hmm. the things that you felt wonderful asking before, the things that you felt effective using as your reference point or your case studies before, those things probably still work. If you don't have the luxury of seeing people in person, a great solution is video. Do a pitch on pre-recorded video or do your follow-up on video. I use a service called Bonjoro, which is B-O-N-J-O-R-O, -O, just so I can send a little video to everybody mm -hmm. at every step of the buying process, right? So the first thing is, whatever your skill set is, find a way to infuse that into online selling. And the other thing is, do not fall for the two traps that I see on templates for when people are trying to sell online who haven't sold before, okay? And they're the exact same problem just through the looking glass of each other. Emotional buyers exist. Mm -hmm. Fact-based buyers exist. Some people are both. Most people are a combination of the two. But a lot of the stuff that I see on the internet is either super fact heavy and loses the joy, the enthusiasm, the pain, the struggle, the strife, the heaven, the hell of the storytelling element, or it's so story heavy now that you're on a digital medium. It's glitzy, it's shiny, it's glamorous. It's got case studies up the wazoo. It's got video and it blinks. But the facts of what you offer and of your quality standards and your FAQs are getting lost. So if you are struggling in this new space, make sure that in all of your touch points, you're combining story and detail, the what and mm -hmm. the why, until you get to know them well enough to know which buyer type they are and how to navigate accordingly. But that's what I see really tripping people up. And the easiest thing to do is just make sure you have both. Yeah, and I think that's a great point and, and certainly one that I think people should take on board because, yeah, I mean, it is hard to know sometimes when you're when you're engaging with somebody virtually what type of personality they are. And, and as you say, there's nothing worse than trying to sell the sizzle to somebody who is an analytical buyer or selling the analytical mm -hmm. or taking the analytical approach to somebody who's a kind of high level 50,000 feet kind of person. Yeah. But that's not but it, that's not always obvious especially in in a virtual setting. Yeah. So make sure you have both. Mhm. Mm Absolutely. Make sure that you have a nice balance of both. And then if you have fancy segmentation, see what they click on, you know, put them in buckets that way as soon as you can. But in the meantime, just include a little sparkle and a little mm -hmm. detail. Yeah. And I think the other thing that people struggle with sometimes in the virtual arena is dealing with silence. And let's and let's face mm -hmm. it. If you if you say something or you ask somebody, you know, a prospect a question, they may need a moment or two to actually consider their answer. But we hate silence. We are scared of silence. So if Annie suddenly, if I ask Annie a question and she suddenly goes silent for a moment and she's genuinely thinking about it, I panic and I go, I better say something because silence is bad. Yep. And I have listened to hundreds and hundreds of sales calls and this is the biggest sin I see. Okay, the biggest, capital B, biggest and the investment for that is two thousand five hundred dollars mm -hmm. 
Uh, I mean, I, that's the full pay. I do have a okay. payment plan. It's two thousand five hundred dollars, but also like your referral. And so I know, um, you know, there are some things that are more expensive, yeah. and there are some things that are less expensive. But like <laughs> your referral. So if twenty five hundred dollars isn't going to work for you, okay, I told you that there's a payment plan. I said that there's a payment plan, right? Yeah. But okay, well, hold on, hold on. You are my cousin's best friend's nephew, and therefore I can give you a better discount than that. Yeah. What was I thinking? It's not twenty five hundred dollars. It's two hundred and fifty dollars. It's two hundred and fifty dollars. Is that better? <laughs> Yeah. And meanwhile, uh, if you could hear what was going on in their brains, they're saying hmm. in the initial thing, when you said it was 500 or whatever, they're going, yeah, OK, that sounds reasonable now. Um, let me see what budget I'll take that out of. And do I need it for one or do I need it for two? And you um, have now, while they're going through this process in the brain, you've now actually reduced it down to $200 before they've even answered. Well, not only that, you've completely talked over. Mm -hmm. there's room off. to make a thought if i was a waiter in a restaurant and i came up and i said these are today's specials and i told you the specials and i said i'll give you a second so that you can figure out what you want to eat and then i just stood there going john did i tell you the specials did i tell you the specials i know they're the specials did i tell you the specials did i tell you the specials did i mention that our chef is well rated did i mention that we have two michelin stars did i mention that did i mention that do you want the specials what the hell not only would you not know what you wanted to order, you would leave the restaurant. Yes, yes, Don't make right. people regret having the whole conversation after you name the price. It totally takes the confidence and rapport that you've accrued throughout and mm -hmm. just shoots it right in the foot. Don't yeah. do that. Say the price. Ask a leading question like, how does that land on you? And then shut <laughs> your beautiful, brilliant mouth. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's it's a great piece of advice, and it is, and it is a skill you got to learn. Unfortunately, um, it is difficult, and I said it can be accentuated some of the difficulty sometimes in, in a virtual environment. That's why it's real important to have your camera on, because at mm -hmm. least if you both have your camera on, and even if the other person doesn't have their camera on you should have your camera on because at least they can they can see you and, and yeah. you know they can understand that you're sitting there waiting for a reply that you're not just like you know right know, that you're there. listening or you can see them if they are on camera yeah. are they taking notes if they're yeah. taking notes they're probably more of an analytical buyer yeah right yeah, watch yeah. and exactly. respond in real time you will be able to tell from their body language, from all the things that you've been taught, from their responses to questions, from the things that they favor, from the way that they respond or their thinking faces, right? All clients have a thinking face. <laughs> what does their thinking face tell you? Well, get them on video if you can. Mm -hmm. And like, to your point, maybe they don't wanna be on video, invite them, say, I'm gonna stay on video. You don't have to come on, but if at any point yeah. you wanna come on, you come on on. Yeah, yeah, I think that's so critically in, important. My thinking face is a look of utter confusion, but that's just me. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> um, but this has been great, Annie. Like, uh, fantastic advice. Uh, all of Annie's information is going to be below this video. But before we go, please do tell people a little bit more about yourself. So my main area of focus is on this sales avoidant piece. So I do go into scripts and calls and all those other things. But if you feel nasty when you sell, we need to talk. And I have a free masterclass that you can take called Making Selling Easy Without Getting Sleazy. That'll be <laughs> in those links. And my pride and joy the jewel of my crown is my podcast which is called too legitimate to quit instantly actionable small business strategies with a pop culture spin we have talked about cobra kai shit's creek the hero's <laughs> journey Brianna, Megan the Stallion, Lady Gaga, all of these different people gleaning small business tips straight from them and making sure you have actionable homework every week. So that's available wherever you listen to podcasts. I would adore it if you would listen and share. Yeah, absolutely. I would encourage you to go check out uh, Annie's podcast. Sounds fascinating. I must ch I'll check it out myself. Um, all right. Well, uh, again, thanks, Annie. Thank you all for joining. My name is John Golden, Sales Pop Online, Sales Magazine, and Pipeliner CRM. I'll see you all again for an interview really soon. Thank you.